So welcome everybody uh, to this new seminar of uh, the NAG ROM series. Today with us, we have Cecilia Pariantini uh, from uh, University of Pisa, and she will talk about structure preserving nonlinear model of the reduction of parametric Hamiltonian systems. So please, Cecilia, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Maria, for the introduction, and, and thank you and uh, all the organizers for the for the invitation and for the opportunity uh, to give a talk at this uh, very nice uh, seminar series. Um, so um, my talk is uh, today is based on a joint work with uh, um, a PhD student uh, Federico Vismara, and uh, the topic, as uh, as Maria mentioned, is. Uh, um, trying to come up with uh, uh, reduced order models for uh, Hamiltonian systems. So you might uh, wonder why we uh, are interested in uh, Hamiltonian systems, uh, where, uh, well, the reason is that uh, uh, under the framework of Hamiltonian mechanics, uh, we can basically describe uh, uh, all phenomena that uh, um, have uh, no viscosity. So all physical processes where there is no form of viscosity, so no friction, no damping, uh, no particle collisions or heat transfer. And the examples of uh, finite dimensional dynamical systems with uh, with this property are mm, the end body problems, uh, for example, used in uh, uh, stellar and planetary motion, uh, the harmonic oscillators, uh, but also some models using uh, population dynamics like the Locke Volterra model or some uh, models uh, from statistical uh, mechanics. Um, we can also think about uh, Hamiltonian system uh, uh, that are infinite dimensional. And uh, uh, so basically uh, in this category, we have all, uh, so all conservation laws. So wave type phenomena like uh, KDB, the wave equation, but also uh, shallow water equation, uh, compressible, incompressible Euler, and uh, uh, some models uh, using uh, plasma physics, for example, the Vlasov Poisson and uh, and Vlasov Maxwell. Um, so uh, the focus uh, of my talk would be on uh, uh, finite dimensional Hamiltonian uh, uh, systems. Um, to to fix the setting, uh, uh, what we consider are uh, evolution equations of uh, of this form, as you see here, where uh, W is the state variable that we assume to be. Uh, two n dimensional. We'll see now in a moment why this is an even number. Uh, and then uh, we also assume that the problem depends on a, a scalar or vector valued parameter. And we want to test the problem for p instances of the, of the parameter. Um, now, when can we say that uh, this dynamical system is actually Hamiltonian? Well, there are two quantities that fully characterize a, a Hamiltonian system in canonical symplectic form. Um, so the the most uh, uh, basic uh, uh, form of uh, of Hamiltonian mechanics. Uh, the first one is the fact that the velocity field of the flow, so the vector x, uh, needs to be a uh, Hamiltonian vector field, namely uh, is a vector of uh, of this form, where uh, j to n uh, is an operator. And then we have uh, uh, the gradient of uh, a function h, and this is the Hamiltonian of the of the system. Now the operator J to N is called the Poisson tensor and the, in uh, canonical symplectic form is defined as you see here on the right. So it's a skew symmetric uh, operator um, that has uh, zero in the main diagonal and then uh, uh, in the two um, off diagonal block, we have the identity and, and minus the identity. Um, well, we can equivalently characterize uh, uh, this, the um, the geometric structure of a Hamiltonian system by looking at the phase space where the trajectories uh, are uh, live. And this phase space needs to be a symplectic manifold. So it's a smooth differentiable manifold that is endowed with uh, with something that is not a metric, it's something more general. It's uh, um, a non-degenerate close to form. And if we uh, endow the, uh, if we consider a canonical uh, local coordinate system, then we can, uh, uh, find the relationship between the symplectic to form and the Poisson tensor that is uh, defined here. And this is the, the expression. Um, so the, the goal of, uh, of, of uh, the work I would like to present today is to try to come up with the, 
efficient computational models uh, and numerical methods to try to compute approximate solution of these kind of problems uh, when we have uh, uh, many parameters. So this uh, P is, uh, is large uh, in a large scale scenario. So with, with uh, many degrees of freedom and uh, possibly over uh, long, long temporal uh, uh, intervals. Um, Typical examples of, uh, of this situation are uh, if we want to simulate the uh, wave type uh, phenomena, for example, the 2D Schrodinger equation, we can assume that the initial condition depends on uh, uh, two parameters. And uh, we also have a parameter in, the, in, in our um, PD. Um, and then you see here that uh, um, the solution for different parameters, so the first row is associated to one parameter, the second to another parameter at different times can behave very differently. Uh, another possible application that uh, we have been interested in uh, is to simulate uh, um, kinetic plasma models based on a particle-based simulation. Uh, when we have a, a parameterized initial condition. So we have an initial condition that depends on two parameters, for example, and uh, uh, starting from an initial distribution of the particles, as you see here on the left, uh, we want to study how they distribute uh, after a certain time. And uh, uh, typically we have a high number of, of particles to have sufficiently accurate approximation, and we might want to test for uh, several instances of the, of the parameter. Um, well, in this context, as, as you all know, the simulation can be extremely expensive in terms of uh, uh, computational time. Uh, so the natural thing would be to try to resort to model order reduction to speed up this, uh, this type of simulation. Uh, the problem with, uh, um, for example, traditional uh, uh, projection-based, uh, uh, reduced basis methods, uh, uh, is that when dealing with conservative system, there are some, uh, um, some extra challenges that one has to face. Uh, the first one is that the typically reduced model do not inherit the physical properties of the full order model. So in our case, if we started with an Ionian system, then the reduced model is uh, typically no longer uh, an Ionian system. Um, Secondly, uh, conservative systems are often not reducible. So these are problems uh, like uh, transport dominated problems, uh, uh, wave type phenomena uh, with a very uh, slowly decaying Kolmogorov and wave. Uh, however, uh, these kind of problems might still possess uh, local uh, low dimensional uh, features. Um, a third point is that uh, uh, it is typically hard to reproduce uh, the dynamics uh, outside of the training data. And uh, if we want to run a long time simulation, so we would need to collect uh, um, uh, data for a very long time to have a, a sufficiently accurate uh, reduced models. And so we might end up with, it, with a very expensive uh, offline phase. Uh, finally, and uh, this is uh, shared by all uh, nonlinear problems, uh, um, uh, when, when we have uh, nonlinear Hamiltonians, uh, then uh, uh, the system becomes nonlinear, and uh, this is typically expensive uh, to deal with uh, if we just uh, perform traditional, uh, if we use tradi a traditional approach. So the, the strategy that we would like to propose is to um, uh, construct uh, reduced order models or hyper reduced order models that uh, can change in time. And uh, at the same time, they preserve exactly the Hamiltonian structure of the, of the original uh, problem. So the, uh, this is a, a brief outline of, of my talk. Uh, I would like to um, introduce a, a possible way to uh, perform a model order reduction of Hamiltonian system that are not uh, global. Um, we then see how to deal with the nonlinear operators with uh, uh, hyper reduction strategies. And finally, um, how to approximate, uh, well, how to update not just the approximation spaces, so the reduced space and the hyper uh, reduction space, but also their dimension. Um, okay, so uh, how do we construct these uh, reduced order uh, models? Um, the first uh, uh, idea or the first uh, part is to uh, recast our problem um, in a new state variable. Now, this is a matrix valued state variable of size 2n times b, 
where basically uh, we put uh, in each column of this matrix uh, the state variable for one instance of the of the parameter. And now we can uh, rewrite our Hamiltonian system exactly as it was before, but uh, just in this new uh, unknown uh, uh, matrix value unknown. Um, now the idea is to uh, approximate uh, the, the full model solution, so the matrix W at each time t, with the decomposition into uh, reduced spaces of size 2n times 2r, where r is uh, hopefully much smaller than n, and then a, a set of expansion coefficient in these reduced spaces, and then we have one uh, vector of size 2r per parameter. So this is exactly as uh, as it is done in uh, traditional uh, reduced basis methods. Uh, the only difference is that we allow both the expansion coefficient and the reduced basis to depend on time. Um, so now the idea is that uh, uh, to derive the reduced uh, model, the reduced dynamical system, we need uh, to uh, derive an evolution equation, not just for the expansion coefficient, uh, but also for the uh, reduced basis. Um, what what uh, what are the desiderata in this? Well, we would like, uh, as I said, the reduced dynamics to inherit the geometric structure of the original problem. So we want to preserve this Hamiltonian structure of the flow. And secondly, uh, we need to keep an eye on the computational cost of uh, of this algorithm. Uh, so differently from uh, traditional uh, reduced basis method, we do not uh, have a separation into an offline. Uh, expensive phase and then an online uh, one. We have only uh, one, basically, uh, one phase where the basis is learned on the fly. So uh, we need to keep, in, there will be a cost that inevitably depend on the size of the, um, uh, of the reduced basis, so N, but we want to keep this cost under control. So we allow an overall computational complexity at most linear in, uh, in N. Uh, okay, so now let's try to see how we derive the reduced uh, dynamics. Uh, um, before saying that, I, I would like to point out that the idea of using uh, local uh, uh, low rank approximations uh, uh, with time dependent uh, basis um, comes from, uh, um, I think, uh, to, well, to the best of my knowledge, to the work of Dirac uh, in the context of uh, molecular dynamics. And this has then been, been used uh, to develop uh, um, uh, numerical algorithms, uh, uh, the multi-configuration, for example, time-dependent R3 method, uh, and then uh, has led to dynamical low rank matrix and, uh, and tensor approximation. And in the context of, uh, of stochastic PDEs, also to the so-called dynamically uh, orthogonal uh, uh, schemes. So, um, from my perspective, all these methods uh, share a common paradigm um, that we also would like to adopt uh, here. And uh, um, this, uh, this idea is the dirac frankel variational principle. Um, so let's, uh, uh, let's see how it works from, uh, uh, in our context. Imagine that uh, this uh, purple line that you see here is uh, our full model solution. Uh, then we can think at the uh, at the state variable w as a point in this uh, uh, in this trajectory, and uh, uh, the vector x is uh, uh, nothing but a vector applied to uh, to the point uh, w. Now, um, if we want to approximate uh, the the full model solution, so the the trajectory uh, in a subspace of the ambient space, say this uh, m two r. Uh, what we could do is to take a point in this subspace, apply the exactly the same vector field X. Uh, the problem is that this uh, vector field will uh, uh, bring the dynamics outside of this uh, uh, subspace. So in order to approximate the dynamics in such a way that it sticks to the, uh, to the subspace M to R, we approximate, uh, we consider the tangent space uh, at this uh, uh, same manifold, M2R, and we approximate the velocity field of the flow with its uh, uh, projection onto the tangent space. So in other words, uh, the reduced uh, uh, solution is, uh, um, well, the full model solution is approximated by the trajectory whose velocity field is given by the projection of the velocity field onto the tangent space uh, uh, to the reduced uh, reduce manifold. 
So now what uh, uh, to give a sort of uh, analytic expression to this uh, dynamical system, we need to uh, define this uh, sub uh, subspace, uh, which uh, happens to be a manifold, uh, characterize its tangent space, and then uh, define the uh, projection operator. So um, as a subspace of the ambient space of uh, 2n times p uh, matrices, we consider those that can be factorized in the product of, uh, as you might guess, a base, what is uh, our reduced basis A and the uh, expansion coefficient Y. And uh, A, we assume to be a matrix that is orthogonal and it's also symplectic. So this ensures that locally, so in each basically point of this manifold, um, we are approximating uh, uh, the solution in a symplectic vector space, which uh, uh, ensures that uh, um, the phase space of the reduced model is still a symplectic, uh, a symplectic manifold. And then we consider as a, a set of expansion uh, coefficient. Um, now, um, how do we define the projection from the ambient space into the tangent space of the manifold? Uh, well, we define it to be orthogonal with respect to the uh, symplectic two form omega. So this is the uh, quantity, the geometric structure on our phase space. And without going into the, the details uh, uh, of the derivation, what we obtain is, uh, is this expression. So we have a part which is associated with the differential of the basis A and the part that is associated with the differential of, uh, of Y. So we can apply this definition to our reduced dynamical system and we end up with uh, an evolution equation for the reduced basis and an evolution equation for the expansion coefficient. So uh, here is uh, how the uh, reduced dynamics uh, uh, looks like. Um, so first of all, uh, a few a few observations. It is possible to show that uh, uh, the reduced solution is uh, um, close to the best low rank approximation of uh, of the uh, solution of the original problem uh, by showing that in the Frobenius norm, the distance between the reduced solution and the uh, best low rank approximation is bounded by the best low rank approximation of the solution with constant that depends on the uh, on the Lipschitz continuity of the right hand side and on the uh, first uh, neglected and the last uh, included the singular values of the uh, of the solution w and uh, this is uh, uh, this can be shown in this context as an extension to a result that was uh, originally proven in uh, in, a, in the paper on uh, uh, by Koch and, uh, and Bubish. Um, secondly, uh, if we look at a bit more uh, into the details of, uh, of this uh, dynamical system, well, we can observe that uh, the evolution of the expansion coefficient is uh, again a Miltonian because it has this, uh, uh, this structure, if you remember, the right-hand side, and so it's now just a lower dimensional system, a two R dimensional per parameter. Uh, and the good thing is that uh, since it is an Hamiltonian system, the Hamiltonian, which is given by the pullback via the, uh, the reduced basis, is still a conserved quantity. Um, the basis is uh, such that uh, um, uh, it satisfies an evolution equation that you see here. And it's such that uh, if we start from a basis that is orthogonal and symplectic, then uh, the solution of this problem will remain uh, orthogonal and symplectic matrix uh, at, all, uh, at all times. Um, so the next uh, natural question would be, uh, yes, we have uh, derived the reduced dynamics with uh, uh, structural properties that uh, we needed. How do we discretize this uh, in time? Uh, well, for the temporal discretization, uh, we resort to uh, partitioned room de Pisa methods. So we basically deal with the two equations separately, and then we uh, perform a suitable, uh, a suitable coupling. Um, let's look at the first equation, uh, the one for the expansion coefficient. Uh, well, this is, as I said, uh, Hamiltonian system, and it is in a canonical symplectic form. So we can basically use a, 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 sim, a symplectic temporal integrator from the from the literature. Um, 
What about the evolution of the reduced basis? Uh, this is a bit more challenging because uh, um, we would like the discrete evolution uh, uh, to remain on the manifold of orthosymplectic matrices. This is what uh, uh, gives us, guarantees us that uh, we are still approximating the phase space with, with a symplectic manifold. And secondly, remember that uh, we want to keep the cost under control uh, by allowing a computational complexity at most linear in, uh, in N. So for this uh, uh, problem, uh, we consider, um, we develop some methods based on uh, uh, local charts um, on the orthosymplectic matrix uh, manifolds. So to give you the idea, um, it goes more or less as follow. Um, let, let's assume that U is a, is a manifold. Uh, in our case, is the manifold of orthosymplectic uh, square matrices, but uh, this is more general. So basically, if we take uh, uh, a point A in a neighborhood of a point Q in a manifold, then this can be expressed as the image of a vector field onto, uh, in the tangent space uh, of the manifold at the point Q under a map, this R of Q, that is a retraction. Um, so now, um, if we differentiate this expression for, for A, well, we have that uh, A dot is equal to the tangent map of the retraction applied to the differential of the B dot. But now, if we look at, uh, at our context, we have that A also satisfies uh, uh, an evolution problem that now I have hidden here in this uh, F of A. And then we can apply this uh, operator basically uh, to, the, um, to our expression. And uh, uh, what we end up with is a new evolution equation, not for A, but for the vector V on the tangent space at the, at the manifold. Um, the good thing here is that if we move from the uh, manifold to the tangent space, the tangent space is a linear space, so we can use explicit, uh, uh, for example, runge kutta integrator, and still we preserve the, the uh, orthosym orthosymplectic uh, constraints, so the orthogonality and symplectic constraints of A. And then once we have solved the evolution for V, we map it back via the retraction and we obtain an expression for, uh, for A. Um, so in our case, how are these operators defined? Uh, well, we define the retraction uh, as the product of the Cayley transform applied to a matrix AB uh, times Q. Um, well, this is uh, because any element in the, yeah, in the horizontal space, uh, uh, so it's a subspace of the tangent space, can be written as the product of uh, uh, skew symmetric Hamiltonian matrix times Q. Um, so uh, this is, uh, it, it can be proven that this is actually a retraction. Uh, it, is, uh, it can be computed at a cost that is linear in N, and the key here is that the Cayley transform is in principle very expensive to evaluate uh, on a, a n, 2n times 2n matrix, but uh, A of B has rank at most 2R. So if we exploit uh, the uh, uh, low rank properties of this matrix, uh, we have a cost that is uh, uh, linear in, uh, in N. Um, also, this problem for uh, V can be solved. Uh, these are just algebraic manipulation, and uh, uh, we can solve a linear system with the complexity n of r square. And finally, the uh, the retraction is uh, locally Lipschitz in the Frobenius norm, uh, which gives us uh, so this tells us that uh, the approximate to reduced basis A converges to the actual one with the order of the runga kutta scheme that we have used to solve the equation for, for B in the tangent space. Um, okay, so let's look at the numerical tests. Now that we have seen the, uh, a bit of the, the algorithm, uh, assume that uh, we want to solve the 1D shallow water equations so, uh, with periodic boundary conditions. Um, we discretize uh, using uh, finite differences uh, and uh, we consider two parameters in the initial condition and we test the problem for 100 values of, the, uh, of this parameter. 
Um, so here on the right in this plot, you see um, the error between the uh, full order solution and the reduced solution at final time in the Frobenius norm. And on the, um, on the X axis, uh, there is the runtime of the algorithm. Um, so there are three different lines. The black dash one is the uh, full order model. So the error is, uh, is zero. Uh, it's just depicted uh, to, to give an idea of what is the computational cost of, uh, of solving the full order model. Uh, and then we compare two different methods. The, um, the red one is a global approach, is a, a, is a structure preserving, so it's a symplectic global uh, uh, reduced basis method of uh, Peng and, and Moseni based on uh, complex SVD. And uh, uh, the blue one is the method that I've just uh, uh, presented. So what, uh, what we can observe is that uh, uh, with a global approach, uh, using a global approach to deal with this kind of problem, um, gives us a result that uh, can become very expensive or as expensive as solving the full order model when we want to have sufficiently accurate uh, uh, approximations. On the other hand, having a, a, glo um, a local uh, dynamical approach uh, allows us to achieve a comparable accuracy, but uh, at uh, much lower cost because we are using uh, uh, smaller, uh, smaller, uh, reduced uh, spaces. Um, so to, to convince you about uh, this fact, uh, um, I would like to show you um, how the solution and the reduced spaces uh, behave. Uh, you see here on top uh, um, the evolution of the full order solution over time uh, for uh, uh, some instances of the parameters. So here are the different uh, um, the lines with different colors. And now uh, on the right, uh, you see um, how the uh, this six, uh, if we take a global uh, reduced uh, reduce basis space with six uh, elements. So here is uh, how the basis element look like. So we have six line and uh, uh, six elements are definitely not enough to accurately reproduce the dynamics uh, uh, for all parameters and for all times. On the other hand, if we use uh, um, Sorry, if we use a, a dynamical approach, uh, you see here on the bottom plot how the uh, reduced basis elements are changing in time and they somehow follow the, the dynamics. So this allows us to have a good accuracy with a, a smaller uh, reduced uh, reduce basis space. Um, Okay, so uh, another aspect that uh, uh, we haven't uh, uh, talked about yet is uh, what is the computational cost of, uh, of, the, of this algorithm? Um, well, we have briefly seen that uh, it is possible to show that uh, the evolution of the reduced basis uh, scales, uh, um, it's linear, the cost, the, the arithmetic complexity is linear in N, is linear in P, the number of parameters, uh, depends on the product and time speed. Um, concerning the uh, Emerponian system, then we have a two R dimensional, so a, a smaller, a small dimensional uh, uh, system, uh, one per parameter. Um, as as you all know, the problem is uh, if we have a nonlinear velocity field, what we need to do is to reconstruct uh, uh, the approximate state, evaluate uh, the nonlinear operator in the high dimensional space, and then map it back. And this typically has a cost that is uh, uh, polynomial uh, in the product of, uh, of NP. So here is denoted by alpha of, uh, of NP. So um, on the one hand, uh, uh, the number of degrees of freedom N and the number of parameters can be potentially both very high. So the product NP can be, can be large. And the second problem is that uh, uh, the presence of nonlinear operators uh, entails a cost that is proportional to solving the to the one of the of the full order model. Um, so what we would like to do is to try to uh, combine hyper reduction and uh, parameter sampling. Uh, let's look at uh, hyper reduction first. Uh, so one of the most uh, um, used and popular hyper reduction techniques uh, is the empirical interpolation method um, that uh, consists in approximated uh, in approximating the high dimensional uh, nonlinear operator uh, using uh, sparse sampling via uh, interpolation. 
Um, so just to recap uh, what, what it is about, uh, in with our notation, we have our dynamical system with the nonlinear uh, right hand side. And this is approximated uh, in, uh, in the range of, uh, of uh, in the span of a basis. Um, here is the matrix B of size 2n times d. D is uh, hopefully uh, much smaller than, than 2n. And, uh, um, and then we have an interpolation matrix P um, where we impose the interpolation condition. So that at the end of the day, the nonlinear operator is approximated with the IM projection, uh, uh, with its, uh, with its uh, IM projection in the range of, uh, of this uh, B. Uh, so the, the IM basis uh, is typically computed from a snapshot of the nonlinear nonlinear operator, and the interpolation points are, are selected uh, inductively from the basis uh, with the greedy or um, or POD type uh, algorithm while constructing the the basis uh, uh, V. Um, so what is the issue in uh, in our context? Uh, well, the problem is that. Uh, Hi, I'm uh, does not preserve gradients because it is an oblique projection. So typically the uh, projection of the gradient of the Hamiltonian is not the gradient of something. And if we don't have the gradient of something, we lose the Hamiltonian structure of the velocity field of the, of the flow. Um, so in literature, there have been um, att attempts to uh, try to come up with the uh, um, uh, with method that that preserve this uh, uh, Hamiltonian structure of the of the flow, um, uh, there are there are very interesting ideas. Uh, the the main challenge is to try to combine accuracy, efficient, uh, and the, the exact preservation of the of the gradient structure. Um, so. What we would like to propose uh, is a uh, um, gradient preserving hyperreduction strategy that uh, uh, that is based on 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 these steps. Um, well, the first one is uh, uh, to perform the hyperreduction not on the high dimensional operator but on the uh, reduced operator, so on the gradient of the reduced uh, Hamiltonian. Uh, then, uh, secondly. Um, we introduce a decomposition of the uh, reduced Hamiltonian into um, a constant, some, some uh, constant uh, uh, di, and uh, a part that depends uh, on the uh, on the state. So, what is this decomposition for? Uh, we want the, the composition to promote uh, uh, sparsity, so that this operator h uh, capital H. Uh, we would like it to, to depend only on few entries of the of the reduced state, and this means that typically the number of terms in this decomposition scales with the uh, with the high dimension uh, n. Uh, typical examples of this decomposition, uh, if we have, for example, the Schrodinger equation, uh, and we approximate with the uh, with the local. Uh, mm, uh, spatial discretization, say finite differences, uh, finite elements, then uh, we can decompose uh, uh, the Hamiltonian in the contribution of the uh, uh, of the degrees of freedom associated with the, uh, with few points. Um, this is typically related with the stencil of the of the discretization. Uh, if we use instead some uh, some particle based discretization, then the Hamiltonian can be the decomposition of the Hamiltonian um, is obtained from the uh, can be written as the sum of the contribution of each particle to the uh, energy of the of the system. Um, okay, so once we have this uh, decomposition, um, what we do is uh, we simply take the gradient. Uh, so, so far we haven't done anything, uh, any, there's no approximation in here. We just decompose, use the decomposition of the Hamiltonian. We take uh, uh, the gradient. And now what we do is uh, uh, we have the Jacobian of this uh, operator capital H uh, that is mapped to the low dimensional space uh, uh, spanned by the columns of, the, of A. And now what we do is we approximate the Jacobian um, of the capital H uh, in this uh, in this reduced space, uh, using for example uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, projection. Um, 
what are the properties of the uh, resulting uh, uh, reduced model, hyper-reduced model? Well, what we have is that uh, by using the decomposition and uh, uh, the, for example, I'm projection, we obtain a new system that is again Hamiltonian with an, uh, with an, with an Hamiltonian that is given by an approximation of the uh, reduced Hamiltonian H, uh, HR. Uh, secondly, this uh, uh, the hyper reduced system is uh, uh, computationally efficient uh, to solve with a cost that is independent on, of uh, N. Uh, due to the fact that uh, the Jacobian is uh, sparse uh, as a result of the Hamiltonian decomposition that promotes uh, sparsity, and the fact that uh, uh, we consider the nonlinear operator in the reduced space where it is uh, uh, much more reducible. And uh, it is possible to uh, show uh, a priori convergence estimates. Um, so we can uh, bound the error between the uh, full full model solution and the hyper reduced solution um, with the quantity that depends on the projection error and uh, on the approximation of the uh, nonlinear uh, nonlinear operator. So with the I'm uh, projection error. Um, and then uh, uh, what about the conservation of the Hamiltonian? Well, the error in the conservation of the Hamiltonian is again uh, controlled by the hyper reduction. So the, um, basically asymptotically, as we enlarge the IME uh, space, um, we achieve the uh, conservation of the Hamiltonian that we had for the uh, full order model. Um, so now the question that uh, uh, that is natural is uh, how do we construct the IME projection? So, so far I've sort of assumed that uh, we have it. Um, let's see how we construct uh, uh, the operator P and so the IME basis and interpolation matrix. Um, well, what we do is uh, we proceed locally. So in each time uh, we construct uh, an operator P of tau uh, with the, um, by resorting to a suitable IM uh, space, uh, V of tau and the interpolation matrix. Uh, the reason is, is twofold. On the one hand, remember our algorithm is uh, has no offline phase. So we do not have uh, training data from which we can uh, construct uh, an IM uh, uh, space. Uh, and secondly, um, uh, it is similar to the approximation property or properties of the dynamics. So the problem, uh, um, um, so the solution manifold uh, is not uh, um, as as no global uh, reducibility properties, and this is analogous for the uh, space of uh, nonlinear, say nonlinear um, uh, data. Um, so we want to somehow adapt the IM approximation uh, over time. Uh, there are other um, strategies uh, uh, that have been uh, developed. Um, I think uh, one of the first one was the adaptive uh, DIME algorithm uh, of Perstorff and, and Wilcox. Uh, more recently, um, there are also techniques based on updating the CUR factorization of the, uh, the nonlinear term. Uh, the way we uh, we decide to proceed is somehow uh, similar to the adaptive dime strategy uh, because uh, we would like to update the IME space with a correction based on solving a minimization problem. We have, a, however, a different uh, minimization problem and uh, uh, we then have also to solve it uh, somehow in a, in a different way. So the way we proceed is that uh, at, the, at the initial time, we construct an IM uh, uh, space, an IM pair from the reduced Hamiltonian at the at time zero. Okay. Then uh, at each uh, subsequent time, uh, what we do is uh, we update uh, the IM uh, uh, basis and uh, and interpolation points uh, by considering this uh, this problem. So uh, we take the nonlinear data at the current time. And uh, we construct uh, uh, a new uh, IM basis uh, from the old one plus a correction. And this correction should minimize the residual, where C tau is the approximation of the nonlinear term at, uh, at the current time. Now, um, 
then the, the interpolation points are then uh, constructed from the updated DIME space using, uh, uh, the, for example, the DIME uh, algorithm, so a, a greedy strategy. Uh, the problem is that for a high number of uh, parameters, uh, solving this minimization problem is uh, is simply too costly. So what we do is uh, uh, we solve a different minimization pro problem uh, based on a, a set of uh, sampling points. This is analogous to the adaptive dime algorithm of uh, Perstorff and, and Wilcox. And also we uh, consider a subsamples of, uh, of parameters. Um, how do we choose the sampling points uh, and the uh, uh, subsample of, uh, uh, of parameters? Well, it is possible to show that uh, um, the residual with the new basis uh, is uh, lower than the residual with the old basis. So somehow we have improved our approximation, if and only if uh, a quantity that we call delta tau is positive. And this quantity depends uh, on, the, um, on the choice of the sampling points and of the uh, sample of parameters. So this suggests that uh, uh, the a way to choose the sampling indices and parameter in such a way that delta tau is, uh, is positive. And that's exactly what we do in, the, in our uh, uh, algorithm. Um, so the leading then arithmetic complexity of the of the update uh, is then uh, uh, linear in n, linear in p, but it no longer depends on the products uh, n times uh, p. And then the cost of solving the hyperreduced Newtonian, as I mentioned, is independent uh, of uh, of n. Um, Okay, let me uh, just mention one uh, uh, last. Uh, point, uh, which is uh, uh, we have seen so far how we can adapt in time the approximation space and the IM uh, uh, space. Um, it is also possible to uh, change their dimension. Why uh, do we want to do that? Let me show you uh, an example that will also come later. Uh, this is the 2D Schrodinger equation. We assume that we have an initial condition that depends on uh, two parameters alpha and beta. And uh, uh, we tested for 100 values of the parameter. And here you see, uh, again, uh, uh, one uh, the solution for one instance of the parameter for different uh, times. So as uh, uh, in the plot on the bottom, you see how the uh, numerical rank of the uh, solution changes over time. And you can immediately see that at the beginning, the numerical rank is around uh, uh, four. Uh, or some, something of this sort, but it quickly increases over time. And then uh, if we uh, perform our algorithm, what we observe is uh, um, the error. Uh, here on the right, you see the error over time. So the good news is that our hyperreduce uh, uh, model perform as the reduced model, basically, in terms of accuracy. The bad thing is that they are both pretty bad, because at the beginning, using uh, uh, a space of uh, approximation space of dimension uh, um, here is four, but then we have the symplectic uh, uh, condition. So it's going to be something like eight or 10 is enough to have an accuracy of 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four. But then as time evolves, uh, the, this is no longer, uh, this, the space is just too small to uh, approximate the dynamics with sufficiently accuracy. Um, so, we propose to uh, update uh, the dimension of the approximation spaces as follows. We compute an error indicator based on the distance between uh, the actual velocity field of the flow computed at the reduced state and its projection onto the tangent space of the reduced manifold. And we keep track of this error over time since uh, the last time the dimension was updated. Now, if this error is larger than, uh, um, than a certain constant, uh, this is user-defined, um, times the error from at the, at the last time we performed the update, we, um, we change the space. So we add to the uh, reduced basis uh, A, the modes that are currently, uh, that are worse approximated by the current reduced space. And this can be obtained by the, uh, from the error. So the error tells us which are the directions that are currently worst approximated, and we add them to the, to the basis. 
And then once we have updated the reduced space, we also update the IM space based on the new uh, nonlinear non -linear term. Um, okay, so just to uh, sum up and summarize the algorithm, uh, we have our reduced dynamical system. We uh, consider a parameter sampling uh, to speed up the, adapt the adaptivity and the evolution of the basis. Uh, and we use hyper reduction for the evolution of the expansion coefficient. So at the beginning, we initialize uh, all, all the quantities. And then at each time, uh, what we do is uh, we select the subsample of the parameters. Uh, and this information comes from the current uh, uh, state. We then uh, uh, evaluate the error indicator. We decide whether it's uh, time or not to enlarge the space. Uh, if yes, we uh, update the dimension uh, of the uh, reduced basis space and of the IM space, as, as I've just uh, shown. And then we uh, push uh, by one time step uh, the, uh, the evolution. So we solve the hyper-reduced system by one step. And then we update the IM spacing uh, via the, the correction by solving the uh, minimization problem. Um, okay, so let's uh, see what happens if we apply now the adaptive algorithm to uh, the 2D Schrodinger equation that uh, uh, I've shown. Um, so here you see um, uh, on the top left, the error over time. And the dash lines uh, refer to the non-adaptive algorithm and the, um, uh, the solid ones refer to adaptive algorithm. Uh, and what we see is that uh, if we adapt the dimension of the space, we can uh, keep the error, the accuracy basically constant over time. Um, this is what happens at the beginning. And then you see the error of the temporal integrator uh, coming in, in, uh, into, into play. Uh, here you see how the dimension of the reduced space uh, is uh, is changing over time, and uh, analogously how the dimension of the IM space uh, is also increasing uh, increasing over time. Um, so in the last plot here you see the error uh, at the final time um, versus the uh, the runtime of the algorithm. So what we observe is that uh, um, the rank activity allows to maintain the initial accuracy. Uh, without the, the adaptivity in the dimension of this approximation space, uh, the accuracy cannot be improved. So this is the best we can do if we start with the with a certain uh, uh, dimension and we stick to it. Uh, and then we also observe that, uh, uh, well, in terms of computational times, uh, the orange uh, uh, dot and square are um, it's always cheaper than uh, than the reduce order than solving the reduce order model without the uh, the upper reduction. Um, okay, so uh, this is the end of my talk. Just a, a few uh, observation. Um, I tried to present a possible way to perform a, to construct a structure preserving hyper reduced model for parametric and Newtonian systems. There are some key ingredients uh, uh, which are the Evolving the reduced space allows small basis, um, even for conservative problems, so where we have slowly decaying Kolmogorov of bandwidth. Uh, the preservation of the structure, both uh, in the reduction and in, in the temporal approximation, uh, allows stability and robustness. And this is also the case when we have an hyper reduction that is gradient preserving. Uh, the adaptivity and the uh, and the parameter sampling allow to have a, a more efficient uh, algorithms. Um, there are definitely many open questions uh, that maybe I'll, I'll leave here in the interest of time. And uh, thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia, for this very nice talk. Thank you very much. So now it's question time as usual. So if you have some questions for Cecilia, you can raise your hand. Yes, like Raul Halder, please. If you have a question, yes, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, uh, I have one question. So at this point, I do lack uh, this ma mathematical aspect of structure preserving wrong. Uh, but uh, I have very basic question is that you applied it on Schrodinger equation and uh, shallow water equations. So 
uh, is it necessary? So, like, if I am not wrong, so for applying this kind of structure preserving ROM, the governing dynamics has to be cast into the Hamiltonian form first. Uh, and then you apply this kind of methods? Uh, yes. So, the, um, the, the framework is the one of the Hamiltonian dynamics. So, so either you have a say Hamiltonian finite dimensional system, conservative system. Uh, then uh, if it's not in Hamiltonian form, you can write it in Hamiltonian form. If you okay. have an inf infinite dimensional system, like a Schrodinger equation, it's a PDE, you can, mm -hmm. uh, um, so the, the setting I've presented is the one where you first discretize in space, and then you have to make sure that your discretization preserves the Hamiltonian structure. So you end up with the finite dimensional Hamiltonian system, and then you apply all the machinery. Okay. So even the Navier Stokes equation also can be cast into this form, and we can apply structure preserving wrong or? So, well, the Euler equation, not the Stokes as a diffusion. Uh, ah, okay, so okay. So it's dissipated. This, okay. It's, okay. Yeah, if you have a dissipation, then this is not, uh, um, yeah, doesn't fall within this uh, Hamiltonian structure. But if you have a compressible, compressible Euler, then mm -hmm. uh, yes, you could in principle. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Are there other questions for Cecilia? Maybe I can ask one question, Cecilia, if, uh, if I can. Uh, in the last slide, uh, basically that you showed the error trends for your adaptive strategies and uh, uh, the other ones. Okay, here. Uh, of course, I mean, it works like uh, better than the standard, uh, the standard techniques that you used before, uh, you know, adding other basis function. But I was wondering, you know, the trend is similar. So maybe if you go on in, in time, you will have this issue, you know, uh, still there. So I was wondering if you are thinking about something that somehow it's able to treat this kind of trend of the error that is growing in time or not. And if you have some kind of experience with that. Um, so you, I, if I understand correctly, you mean here? Yeah. Uh, so here is um, mostly due to the uh, temporal approximation. Okay. So what, uh, in principle, if you enlarge your basis, uh, uh, sort of, of of the in the in the good direction, uh, you could in principle see an almost uh, constant uh, uh, error. Uh, but then, of course, you have to take into account that there's an error coming from the temporal integrator. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, this has to be... Uh, so, yeah, maybe I should have shown something where I have a very small time step. And then, uh, yeah, uh, you could uh, you could see um, a, a, a almost flat behavior of, of this. We have it for, for, for example, 1D Schrodinger equation, uh, where we observe uh, something that is almost kept constant uh, since the beginning. Okay. It also depends on uh, how many bases are you willing to add, uh, because of course, uh, uh, if you are very, if you aim very uh, small accuracy, then uh, in principle you need to to add a very high number of of bases, uh, and then the cost uh, uh, becomes uh, becomes much higher. Uh, it, yeah, of course, it's it's a usual trade off between between uh, how much uh, accuracy and uh, uh, how much are you willing to spend in terms of computational time. But in principle, starting from uh, uh, certain accuracy by enlarging the reduced space, uh, you can keep it uh, uh, throughout the simulation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Yes, Tomas, please. Hello, uh, thank you Hi. for so interesting conference. So I, I have one question is uh, uh, you are constructing your right hand side in the uh, reduced Hamiltonian system uh, by step time step by time step. So uh, I wonder whether uh, they they uh, they are discontinuous in time or uh, other really I didn't understand whether they were continuous or discontinuous. So the um, um, 
uh, you mean the the um, the reconstructed Hamiltonian, say the Hamiltonian, uh, the right yes. hand side of the yes. of the thing. So if uh, if I sort of interpret your question, uh, um, so the Hamiltonian becomes uh, non-autonomous because then you introduce uh, an approximation that changes over time. And so locally, uh, it's uh, it's still a conserved quantity, but uh, at the interfaces between two intervals, uh, you will have a discontinuity. And so this is not um, included in, in this uh, kind of simulation. So we have a discontinuous approximation. And what we have observed is that the Hamiltonian is, is not uh, exactly conserved as, as you would have uh, say in, in some situations for very special Hamiltonians using, for example, asymplectic integrators, but because of this partition, the runge kutta method at the interface between two intervals uh, and the fact that the basis is changing, you have a sort of, a, uh, you introduce a further error in this uh, conservation. Okay. Uh, we observe that it doesn't grow, uh, but uh, we do not have a proof of, uh, of whether this is, uh, uh, bounded, so the error is bounded uh, by something that depends on the order of the approximation of the scheme. This is something we don't have. Okay, okay, uh, I see. So, you know, in principle, the standard theory, at least uh, theory for uh, differential equations, you know, there is at least existence of solution for continuous right-hand sides. So uh, what I mean is that, an extension of the error analysis for these, these I mean, uh, time discontinuous approximations would be needed, no? Uh, okay, no, I see. So the, the evolution is, is continuous. Uh, the, um, uh, the Hamiltonian that characterizes the flow becomes time dependent. So as uh, so at the continuous level, things are still continuous, but yes. as, as yes. soon as you introduce a, a temporal discretization, you sort of... Uh, 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 you have a, a, no longer an autonomous system, so you introduce okay. an approximation of the Hamiltonian that is. Uh, okay, okay, I see, I see. It's like approximating your Hamiltonian system by a non-Hamiltonian one. Okay, with a yeah, or, or yeah, non-autonomous okay. one. Yeah, uh, non-autonomous one. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Now it's more clear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other questions. It looks to me that there are no other questions. So maybe we can thank once again Cecilia for her talk. Thank you, Cecilia. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. And uh, we see each other next Tuesday for the next seminar. Thank you, everybody, for being here. <laughs>